So in this video I'm going to review the year 13 mock exam we did and in this video I'm going to look specifically at the practical components that were examined in it. So let's first scroll through the question that we're looking at capacitors. Uh, it's a little bit of a tricky question this one so we've got two capacitors we've got C1 that's fully charged to start with to six volts but the switch is open so it's not discharging. Now we've got C2 over here which currently is discharged and we're measuring the potential difference across C2 over time uh, and they're going to these two resistors can discharge through these resistors. Okay so uh, in terms of what's going to happen essentially when the switch is closed this one is going to discharge over time. This one will initially charge uh, until it and C1 reach an equilibrium so there's the same potential difference and then this one will start to discharge once this C1 isn't big enough to charge it anymore. So that's kind of what's going to happen and this is essentially a table of data that was collected with some gaps in it that would allow you to essentially plot a graph and have a look at how this works. So the first question was looking, as it often was in these old ISA questions, um, at completing a table of data. And so the key thing is going to be maintaining consistent precision all the way down your column. Um, so that's what you can see there. Now the reason there are two values here is because you could have considered only these two and excluded this one, um, or you could just have included all three. Either way, um, I am fine with uh, here as a method because they both make sense, but ensuring they're all two decimal places. Then for this next one, uh, estimating the percentage of uncertainty in the t equals 25. Um, so the first thing is you've got repeat reading, so you should be calculating your uncertainty, not just guessing that it's the precision of the measuring device. So we've got our largest and our smallest repeat readings. We've found the range divided by two, and that gives us the uncertainty. And then percentage of uncertainty is uncertainty divided by value times 100, and it's always given to two significant figures. So that's what you can see there. The graph plotting I will show you in a second. Once I turn over the page, well, that's fairly straightforward. Um, this next question here is simply a case of reading values off of a graph, so identifying the maximum value and reading off the T and the V. Um, a lot of people on this forgot the units, and I can see I've been an absolute melon and for some reason said this is measured in seconds when obviously it's going to be measured in volts. Um, but yeah, a lot of people forgot the units here. You need to make sure you keep those. And then for the final one, estimate the uncertainty in your reading of T max from your graph. So the key thing here was that the top of the graph was a long flat section. So there was actually some uncertainty in the value you read off. And so you've got a range of possible values that it could have been and uncertainty is range over two so i'll show you how that works so what we've got here is the graph so you can see the points have been plotted here here and here uh, those are the points from the table we've drawn a nice smooth curve through all of the points and you can see at the top there is a flat section which gives some uncertainty as to where the maximum value is and I've got there is an uncertainty of three seconds that anywhere in that region could have been the maximum and so uncertainty is range divided by two so if that's three seconds that means there's going to be 1.5 either way or uncertainty on this one um, so that's where the uncertainty in the reading a value from the graph comes from. A lot of people just said it was going to be 0.5 because that's the smallest division in your graph, but that's not really giving you a decent idea of what the uncertainty, we can see the uncertainty is much bigger on the diagram. Okay. Then we've got a question uh, looking at some theory to do with the graph. So we've got uh, an equation that is suggested for calculating T max. So all you had to do is put some values in and calculate the answer. Loads of people forgot to give a unit for this one and throw away a really easy mark. Um, shame on you really, forgetting units is a rookie mistake. And then 
looking at whether this value here agrees with the one you measured from the graph. So the key thing is you've kept got the uncertainty previously, so you know it's plus or minus 1.5 or whatever you had. So this gives you a range of possible values for the measurement from the graph. This is what we got, which is inside that range. So it does, within the uncertainties you've calculated, agree with that result. So yes, it does. And the reason is because it's inside the uncertainty. It's not enough here just to say they're close. That doesn't mean anything. You need to be specific here. So in this question, we're looking at if you increase the time constant of the first capacitor, but don't change it for the second, what's going to happen in terms of the Vmax and the Tmax values? So to start off with this, I looked at what happened to the Tmax because we have an equation to calculate it. So you can see that we've got when we put in the numbers, we get a much larger value. So it's going to take much longer to reach that T max value. That's the first thing. The second thing is working out what happens to the V max. So if this is the graph of the first capacitor that we're using to charge up the other one here, if you increase the time constant, what that means is you're effectively having a much slower rate of discharge from your capacitor. Yeah, that's what I mean. But it tells you the time constant of the second one isn't affected. So that one will be charging up at the same rate. So we can see that this original capacitor maintains its potential difference much longer, whereas this one's going to go up at the same one. So previously, maybe this one would have stopped here in the first one and then started to decrease because it's then starting to discharge. But if this charging capacitor maintains its potential difference for longer, but this one's rate of change increases, that would mean you're now able to charge it to somewhere up here and then go like that one. So we can actually see that the V max is going to end up increasing because the other one maintains its potential difference higher for longer there due to the increased time constant. So we end up with a bigger T max, but also a bigger V max. Whereas a lot of people were saying in this question that V max would decrease, uh, which is not what would happen at all there. And if we're getting much slower rates of things, the final thing is like the peak section of your graph, you're likely to get be longer and flatter. So before we had like an uncertainty of 1.5 seconds, it's gonna get flatter and longer. So that's gonna increase actually as well. Okay, so that completes this capacitors question. So the second one is looking at uh, gravitational field strength and how we can go about measuring. This question is essentially about linking into the G by free fall practical, which is why we stuck it in this uh, mock exam. So the first thing is what is gravitational field strength? Well, it's the force experienced by a unit mass in a gravitational field, it's something you just have to know their definition. But the key thing to recognize is it's also on Earth anyway, known as little g or the acceleration due to gravity. So when it asked you to design an experiment to measure it, essentially it was asking you to describe the g by free fall experiment, which is one of the required practicals. You could incidentally have also done with a, with a pendulum and used that to find g. That would be a very valid method. But this is what they were essentially looking for, because this is the one they expect you to know from like year 12. So in terms of the first one, looking at a setup, the best way to do this would be using light gates, or you can use a magnet and a trap door, some way of having improved um, accuracy in your time measurement. Uh, so that's the first thing you're looking for in the diagram. They were also looking for your measuring devices. So identifying using a light gate and a, for time um, and a meter ruler for distance. So what you're going to do is you're going to change the height and you're going to measure the time and your light gates will be connected, connected to a data logger. So that would give you the time taken to fall that distance. And you plot a graph of T squared versus height. Um, and the reason for that is it comes from this equation here, half at squared. If you drop it, u is zero, so we can get rid of that. So we, that's why we've got a graph t squared against s there. 
Okay, so we're going to use a range of heights. So we're going to use some longer distances to increase the times to reduce the percentage uncertainty. And we would repeat each of the uh, measurements there so we can get an average to get rid of some of the random errors that might crop up in our results. And from our graph, if we calculate the gradient, we can work out essentially what the acceleration due to gravity is, which is also known as the gravitational field strength. Um, so that's that right there. The second part of this question was looking at the relationship between uh, distance and the field strength. So there's an inverse square relationship. So if you double the distance, you should quarter the field strength. If you triple the distance, you should divide by nine. If you times by four, you should divide by 16. So that's how that works. You're using this inverse square law over here. And these will all be to two significant figures because the data you're using to calculate them is. Then it's just a case of plotting your values on a graph and drawing a line. Nothing too difficult there. Um, yeah, should be fairly straightforward. Um, a few people lost marks here because they showed it crossing the x-axis. It's not. It's just decreasing over time. It's never going to hit the x-axis. So the working out the potential energy required to move from this distance to from 4 to 10 times 10 to the 7 meters. So we might know that field strength is the potential gradient. So the gradient of a potential versus distance graph is the field strength. Uh, or conversely, the area under a field strength versus distance graph is the potential. So if we find the area between two distances, that tells us how much the potential changes between those distances. So then if we multiply by the mass that's moving, we can work out what the potential energy is. So what I, I used a counting squares method. So I worked out that one square is this much potential. So in this section here, we've got a change in potential of around 6.5 times 10 to the 6. There's some tolerance, and so you, you don't have to be exact. And then we've got the change in potential. We multiply by the mass. That gives us a change in energy. Um, if you wanted on this one, you could have calculated some of the values and done this by a calculated method, but this is what they were really looking for here. Okay. So that concludes the practical section of this exam, so I'm going to stop this video here.